Hello everyone, welcome back to Take Charge of Your Health and to our second meeting this weekend. I'm your host, Sosa Stojkovic. Again, we will appreciate if you say hi, share your experiences and thoughts about mental health and you're welcome to write your questions in the chat section on YouTube as we will have a 30-minute Q&A segment after the presentation where our guest speakers will answer your mental health questions. Also look for any relevant information about our ministry and our guest presenter in the description box. Yesterday we focused on breaking the stigma around mental health, creating a healthy discussion around it, and Lynette touched on many important aspects of it. We're hoping we will have Lynette back in the future to unpack some of um, the points she mentioned yesterday. But today we are invited to hear Lynette's and Jamie Lee's personal experience with anxiety. And we are grateful for their willingness to let us into their lives to bless and encourage others. If you want to know more about Lynette, please watch our previous presentation with her. It was truly a great presentation with lots of um, great information. So today we will listen to Lynette and Jamie Lee's testimony, a mother and daughter, and they'll be talking about breaking through um, anxiety. First, we will hear Jamie Lee's testimony about her anxiety, and then Lynette will share about family's role in supporting without stepping over boundaries. Let's welcome to the program um, Lynette. Welcome back. Thank you. And, and Jamie Lee, um, welcome to the program. Thank you guys so much for being here and letting us into your lives and sharing your um, personal experiences with anxiety. Thank you. It's wonderful to be back, Sassi, and uh, thank you for the invitation and, uh, and to my wonderful daughter for being so courageous to join me tonight to share. Yes, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. It is a blessing and it's always um, a privilege when we get to um, when we get to relate um, to mental health on, um, on personal level like this. So um, I'll start with a word of prayer and then um, we will hear Jamie Lee's testimony. Um, dear Lord, thank you so much again for bringing us together. Thank you for another opportunity to hear personal testimonies today. And thank you for the courage. Thank you for the willingness that you give to our speakers. And today, especially to Jamie Lee and Lynette, um, that we can relate more on personal level again and we can learn and be blessed. Um, thank you. And uh, we ask all these in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So, Jamie Lee, if you want to start, tell us about your personal experience and I guess as the name suggests, as the title suggests, um, breaking through that anxiety. Yeah, thank you. Um, I might just have my own prayer if that's okay um, sure. before we begin. Um, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity that you've given me today um, to share my story um, with anxiety and how when I reached out to you, um, you helped me overcome it. And um, as I speak today, Lord, um, I pray if there's someone out there who's facing the same thing that I went through, that um, they may feel um, that your presence is with them and know, know too that you will um, help them through whatever they're going through, just as you did for me. And so speak through me today and calm my nerves. And, yeah, we pray all these things in your wonderful name. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. So here is my um, journey with anxiety. You know, everybody suffers from anxiety at one or more times in their life. And um, it's a normal emotion when we step out of our comfort zones. So, for example, an interview, public speaking, or even right now. Um, the anxiety I will talk about today is um, general anxiety disorder. It normally um, can be chronic and last uh, long term, but it is treatable. It normally includes excessive fear or worry on a daily basis, sometimes with reason, but most times without. I have suffered mildly with anxiety my whole life, but never to the point where it stopped me doing everyday life. It wasn't until I was pregnant with my firstborn, um, Sahara, um, and she was born that this anxiety reached its peak. The first time I experienced the sudden feeling as if the whole world was just closing in on me. You know, um, we had bumped into a family friend um, in Woolworths and I was having a conversation when all of a sudden I just, I couldn't breathe. My heart was pumping. Um, I felt de detached and almost dizzy. And my husband looked at me and as we said goodbye to her, I said to him, I just need to get out of here. Like, I just remember it all so well. I now know this was a panic attack and the first of so many to come. So what brought on my anxiety disorder? I believe many factor, factors contributed. My diagnosis um, with Hashimoto's at the time, which if you're familiar with, is an autoimmune condition and is an inflammation of the thyroid gland, which um, makes hormones that control our whole body functions. And this can cause issues with um, hormonal imbalance, fatigue, heart conditions, mental health, and so on. Um, the diagnosis I got was long-term and would be something I would need to manage with regular blood tests and thyroid medication, which I did start almost immediately. I was also experiencing um, traumatic afterbirth um, illness, and this went on for quite some time after the birth of Sahara. And the appointments and the pain my body was experiencing, it just really took a toll. I was also dealing with um, some guilt with other life issues, some personal traits such as perfectionism and OCD traits, just unresolved issues and just a lot of massive life changes at the time. And I also believe there was a lot of spiritual attacks, um, which I will touch on in more detail later on. So as you can see, um, I had a lot going on at the time. Um, so I believe as a whole, these factors um, contributed to causing the flare up to occur. And if you're facing anxiety or any mental health condition, I believe it's important um, to find the root causes because when we identify those root causes, we can then manage and address those issues um, in order to move forward. So getting back to my story, um, it only got worse from this point. It got so bad that I just couldn't be on my own. I couldn't leave the house on my own. Um, some of my symptoms I felt frequently were panic attacks and this wouldn't occur for no apparent reason and almost um, at any time. This would normally be accompanied by body shaking, rapid heart beating and breathlessness, um, feeling worried for no reason, feeling like there was something bad going to happen, um, intrusive thoughts, and just overall restlessness and tiredness. You know, Sahara was around six months old um, when my symptoms peaked. And even though like I loved her and I cared for her, I just didn't want to be left alone with all the symptoms that I was experiencing above. You know, what if this? What if that? Um, I needed my husband Damien for everything. And this resulted in him having to take time off work and study um, as we were a young couple. I didn't enjoy social gatherings as much. I didn't want 
to really be in public settings and to others I may have seemed fine as I was quite good at masking it and as many knew before my anxiety blew up. I was very bubbly, social and a confident person. It was only really my husband that knew what was really happening to a certain degree and my parents who saw the impact too. I soon decided that I needed some professional help. Um, not only was it emotionally draining for myself, I could see the impact it was having on those around me. And so I chose to seek some counselling and I received the diagnosis that I did in fact have severe anxiety. And we know that with anxiety, there is almost um, always elements of depression um, and possibly even some postnatal depression in my instance. Um, and, I, you know, mum touched a little bit on that last night. But from my diagnosis, I was told the anxiety was more severe than the depression side. Um, I was offered medication to help relieve the symptoms, but I turned it down as in my pers as in my personal situation. I just didn't think it was needed. Um, I was also told because my anxiety was lesser, sorry, because the depression was lesser than the anxiety that I, I could recover without medication. Um, I attended regular counselling sessions for a month or two. However, I didn't find it all too helpful. I did try using some of the techniques, but um, found it all too hard and soon again found myself just in the same cycles. You know, um, anxiety is such a mind game. It riddles your mind and body with excess fear and worry. And all these fears and thoughts, they just play over and over in your mind. But as much as it's the mind, it also impacts the body physically too. And um, unfortunately, if you don't experience it for yourself, it's hard to understand what someone with anxiety is truly facing. Um, it can be lonely, scary, and extremely draining and debilitating. And these are all the emotions that would just suffocate me day and night. It was literally a constant flow of unhelpful thoughts that just wouldn't stop. We know mental illness can be brought on for a number of reasons. And, you know, I've covered my personal reasons above. And for every individual, this will vary. But I truly believe anxiety or any mental health struggle is also something that Satan uses to defeat and attack us as Christians. And it's not something we really like talk about, but the attacks are real and strong. In a, um, we know in Ephesians 6 verse 12, it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You know, Satan's target is our mind and his weapons are his lies. And, you know, growing up a Christian, it was interesting to note that at the time my anxiety peaked, I was the furthest from God. You know, after drifting away from him with some of the life choices I had chosen to make, even in this time, like I never left my faith. I knew the power of God and I always believed. And in a way, um, in my desperation with struggling with anxiety, it brought me back to the source of peace. And I feel like this was the start to the turnaround in my journey with anxiety. So I will share with you my recovery and what got me to where I am now. I found myself getting back into my faith and this would bring me great moments of relief. Um, it wasn't until I decided that I totally needed to re-surrender to God and truly repent um, and make a change. I, I can still remember, I just felt this instant relief. Um, I felt God's presence of peace and healing in those moments. And when I wouldn't experience an anxiety attack, um, which would be much worse at night in the darkness, first of all, I would need um, to get the panic attack under control, which I did with the deep breathing. 
um, and mum covered that technique last night, um, then I would almost immediately just grab my phone because it was obviously dark um, and I would open up my Bible app and, and look up some of my favourite Bible verses. And I just wanted to share um, them with you if anyone would like them to use in their own struggles. And um, they are James 4, 7, submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Um, you know, because I felt like it was getting attacked so spiritually at that time. And um, 1 Peter 5, 7, that says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, that says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And this one was probably one of my favourite ones because it just, painted such a beautiful imagery in my mind and it says do not fear for I am with you do not be dismayed for I am your God I will strengthen you and help you I will uphold you with my righteous right hand found in Isaiah 41 10 and I would just say these verses out aloud or in my mind and it would just bring me peace and my panic attack would subside and I would normally be able to go back to sleep. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, as Christians, we can know the scripture, but it's so important to apply them to our lives, you know, and really claim the promises that God gives to us. And this is what I did. It's it's really a freeing moment when you surrender to God and give him the control, and not just a little bit of control, but total control. And, you know, when we reach out in faith, as we see in the Bible so many times, all those that reached out, they were healed. And so I reached out to God. And so prayer and scripture, they were my comfort. And, you know, as I reflect back, I can see that anxiety focuses a lot on oneself. It's really all about you and the feelings and the thoughts that your body is going through and the what ifs that actually never really happen. Some days would be better than others, but on the bad days, I would wake up and think, is this really how my life is going to be? The spiritual war was real. And even though I was diagnosed with severe anxiety, I chose to not let it define me. I knew my true identity was in Christ. You know, we can so use the excuse of our illnesses to hold us back in life. But fortunately with God, it just doesn't cut it. He has plans for us, plans to prosper us and not to harm us, plans for hope and future. And that's found in Jeremiah 29, 11. And in 2 Timothy 1, 7, it says, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love and self-discipline. And this verse, I believe, we can apply when we are faced with anxiety because with the help of the Holy Spirit living within us, we have the power to change our mind towards godly things and be set free from our negative thoughts. Forwarding my story three years <clears throat> around the time my second daughter, Savannah, was one years old, I soon found another counsellor with the help of mum that really helped me thought, talk through a lot of issues I was dealing with. This counsellor gave me a lot of techniques such as more breathing techniques and this one sounds funny but it works you know just laughing at the unhelpful thoughts and not giving those thoughts power over my mind and just talking through the issues I was struggling with internally you know the importance of finding a good counsellor and even a Christian counsellor is a bonus if you have had a bad experience with one counsellor try again it really makes a big difference along with the technique she aided me I also chose to change my lifestyle which included a change in diet. I was always a healthy eater, but I decided to give up dairy, gluten and sugars and opt for a more plant-based diet. And this really helped clear my mind. And a bonus also aided in managing my Hashimoto's. I also adopted a more natural lifestyle with the products I used in my everyday life. Um, it's amazing how when you look into the foods we eat and the products we use every day, how much they impact our body and mind due to the toxins they contain. 
I also exercised more and spent more time outdoors in the sunshine and, of course, surrounded myself with family and friends. I am grateful for the support of my husband and parents. My husband was an earthly rock for me through these times and did the best to understand my feelings. I know now how hard that can be for a life partner, but God really was guiding him to help me overcome my anxiety and it grew our marriage spiritually. God doesn't promise we won't face storms in life, but God promises us that he will be by our side and help us get through it. Looking back, I see the hand of God guiding me and those around me out of the dark times and back into the light. I am grateful for my parents, for their endless devotion to God's work, which I've seen my whole life, and for leading me to know in God and serve God. And um, mum gave me the responsibility to help in our local church plant. You know, mum wasn't going to enable my anxiety. She knew if she gave me an option, it probably would have been Oh, maybe, probably no at that stage. So she gave me the task and said, I know you can do it. So I soon had the courage with the Holy Spirit and through a lot of prayer, and I'm sure the prayers of others and all the changes I had made in my lifestyle, working through my anxiety to start helping out in church and serving in the children's Sabbath school. Before the birth um, of Sahara, my firstborn, I had commenced a bachelor in primary teaching I always felt this was my calling from God and I remember the first Sabbath school class I took and I just felt joy and I can't remember feeling anxious and I know everyone can be happy but true joy is only found in the presence of God and it was fulfilling and it was rewarding and when God uses you to work for him he heals you in the process. I truly believe this. Serving God played a big part in healing me from my anxiety, looking back on the whole experience. And I'm still enjoying leading out in the children's Sabbath school eight years on. So for someone who is in recovery from anxiety, I just wanted to share a miracle that God worked in my life four years ago. I was very sick after the birth of my last born son, who we called Isaiah. And um, after birth, physical illness is not something I wasn't used to. You know, I was faced with this, as I've discussed earlier on, with my previous two births of my daughters. And for someone who had struggled in the past with severe anxiety, this should have probably caused another flare-up or a relapse. I faced five emergency admissions with week-long hospital stays with unknown temperatures reaching 40 and over. I had a newborn baby, Haziah, in hospital um, who I was breastfeeding. Sahara and Savannah at home with either mum or hubby as they were taking turns coming to hospital to be with me. I was on constant drips, antibiotics, um, and and I ended up getting Quincy, over 100 tests, x-rays, and scans. And the doctors had absolutely no idea that um, the illness was a mystery. And this was over a three-month period, so it it wasn't a short stint. It it was quite a long time. Um, If it sounds like a nightmare, it was. um, It was it was the weakest physically I have been my whole life. And even with all my previous health issues, um, at one point I actually thought, "This is it." That's how physically ill I felt. But in this time, I was certainly not mentally weak as many would have expected me to be. Although Satan was trying very hard to defeat me once again, and many times I was overcome with great emotion, it wasn't the same emotion as the anxiety I had previously faced and felt. This time I had the peace and comfort of God. I just believed that he saw the bigger picture and he would get me through it. The support of my family and church family, all the prayers brought me so much comfort a bonus to being part of a church family. I just knew that God would not leave me. He hadn't so far, and I'd come so far with my anxiety. I wasn't going to let this defeat me. One day when I was sitting at the back of my parents' place after a week-long stay, I said to God in my quiet moments, I honestly can't continue being so unwell. I want to continue to serve you. You know, please just show me two rainbow birds as a sign that this sickness would end or, you know, I just needed something because I was just so physically ill. 
And I didn't see anything that day. And looking back now, I see that God's timing is not our timing, but his timing is perfect. And days later, we planned to go to a holiday resort with my parents as a getaway. And as I stood on the balcony, the first moments we got there, still very weak, I looked out into the trees and there, right in front of me, there was there I saw two rainbow lorikeets fly from the tree into the sky. And, you know, some may say coincidence, but I say that's my God talking to me. He's ever present and he's longing for us to have that deep relationship with him. And, and he just wants us to reach out to him. And in the stillness, he does speak to us in different ways. But we need to be seeking him and listening. This I experienced time and time again. And from that day, I did not step back into hospital. And once again, I was reminded of how my God is a God of healing and hope. Once again, as the world faced fear two years ago with the pandemic, I didn't feel this same fear. I knew my life and my health was in God's hands. He really opened my eyes to see the truth and I chose to trust in his protection over my life and my family. And I know whatever life throws at me in the future that God will be by my side. But if the pandemic has taught me anything is that Jesus' second coming is sooner than we know and we need to be ready. I'm still a work in progress and by no means can I tell you my anxiety is fully gone. But life is back to routines as a stay-at-home mum. I'm back to being a social butterfly and I love serving in God, love serving God in whatever ways I can. In summary, you know, from where I was to where I am today is only the work of the Holy Spirit. It's strong faith. It's acceptance that I did in fact need help. It's lots of effort. <laughs> so putting in the work to get better, such as lifestyle changes and all the other things that I listed above. And perseverance, you know, not giving up when I felt like it and just kept moving forward. And my children were a big factor in this. I just wanted to be the mother they needed. And not only that, but be the mother God wanted me to be to them, an example of a godly mother and wife. You know, as I look back, on my life so far, I'm truly blessed. Those lows helped mould me into the person I am today. It grew my character and my relationship with Jesus and those close to me in a very deep and meaningful way. The struggles we go through and face at the time can be so painful, but God always turns bad into good for those who love him and he will use those struggles to one day become your story. So just know if you're facing anxiety, you're not alone. I'm living proof that things will improve. We have a friend in Jesus, the greatest counsellor, healer, comforter, listener, and we have a, the hope of eternal life through him. You know, Jesus says, if we have faith as small as a mustard seed, we can move mountains. With God, all things are possible. He works miracles. In Romans 8, 28, it says, all things work for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And I just wanted to end on this verse found in Isaiah 40, verse 3, and it says, that those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So thank you for listening to my story today. And, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And amen to a lot of the things that you say, Jamie Lee. It's, um, I was listening to your testimony and I was thinking, um, I think a lot of us even mildly experience a lot of these things. And um, I think reaching out helps talking about it helps not being ashamed and uh also going to the source of peace like you mentioned as well and wisdom mm -hmm. so yeah really encouraging and i was also listening and thinking about how 
Um, Lynette, being a professional, also didn't interfere, but it seems like she guided you to find the way instead of like saying, well, I know uh, as much as other counsellors would know, let me yeah, definitely. <laughs> let me help you. Let me, yeah. Yeah, so, no, Mum definitely, um, I think Mum's like definitely helped when she needed, obviously, um, she put me in the right hands. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also just remembering other Bible examples, um, just... Mommy. <laughs> Sorry. Mommy. Um, hey, Mommy. So just remembering other Bible examples of how, um, uh, just remembering the example of Paul, how the blindness or even afterwards with the experience that he had, um, uh, that he always had that issue with his sight. And sometimes we should just... Um, we should just realize that we can't be a perfect always. Maybe someone is more prone to anxiety, another person is prone to other um, other issues. So sometimes they are um, a good reason for us to grow and uh, maybe be always seeking God for wisdom and um, and for peace. So sometimes they are a blessing in disguise. I find. Yeah. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> Lynette, um, what do you have for us to say? And maybe before um, we go on to your side of the story, we have a few comments here that we got while we were, um, while Jamie Lee was talking. And someone said, hi, I had a major operation back in 2014. Um, the anesthetic gave me ketamine for painkiller. Um Okay, so I never suffered with anxiety before until I had a panic attack in the hospital when I was recovering. I had to have a, per a person next to me in the hospital bed. And the person also says I can relate to the panic attacks regard, um, regarding never to be alone. However, I only had one panic attack, but I felt I could slip up into an attack quite easily. I didn't know what was going on. Um, I had to call upon huge uh, amounts of self-discipline. I wasn't close to God at the time. However, looking back, I feel he was strengthening me during the attacks. Um, could it be caused by the uh, ketamine? I'm okay now. So maybe, um, Lynette, either you could address that if it's um, your expertise or uh, if you could comment on that um, but this is their personal testimony yeah look uh, i'm not medical so uh, you know if that was given to um uh, in a hospital setting i'm 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 assuming it's part of the medical protocol that they use to to treat the the person so i don't feel that i have the skills to to comment on medication um uh, side effects uh in this particular instance. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry that I'm not able to answer that question, whether it was that particular medication that caused that. But, you know, usually when we when we take certain medications, there's always a leaflet that goes with the medication that sometimes can tell you it may trigger, you know, um, anxiety-related responses or, in, or, or panic attacks uh, as a contraindication. Um, Sadly, when you're in hospital, you don't get that leaflet. They just give it to you, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not able to com to comment on the, that particular drug. Yeah. And I've heard before they say you are your own doctor. If you think that <laughs> it, um, it was related somehow, then maybe it was. And um, we had a comment, of course. Um, uh, the comment was... For someone who's nervous even doing this presentation you've done a great job well done um and it's directed to jamie lee of course and um 
again, another person says, praise to be God, your story. I can relate to Miss Jamie Lee. You're very brave. Thank you for sharing. I understand and can completely relate to getting control. I wasn't as clever to call on God. Mm. Praise God, definitely. A wonderful story, the person says as well. Um, okay, well, um, over to you, Lynette. Please um, share with us what you would like us to know about um, your side of the story. Yes, thank you, thank you. And thank you, Jamie, for being so courageous tonight uh, and, and blessing others. Um, you know, um, um, I, I guess I want to share the family perspective tonight because um, uh, mm -hmm. we were watching close up what was happening to Jamie Lee. And, uh, and I do believe that um, um, often families suffering in the process can be quite, um, can be easily missed and can be easily um, sometimes uh, not even recognized, you know, that there is a, a pain that goes with watching your loved one, um, you know, go through this journey. And I think Jamie alluded to, you know, the, the, her husband, Damien, and, and, and what he was experiencing and how others around her were impacted. So I'm really talking to people tonight who are living with someone who is struggling. I, I want to be able to reach out to you tonight. Um, uh, and to share with you what worked, what didn't work, and and what helped us um, get through, uh, you know, to where we are um, today. So just setting the context, you know, Jamie lives twenty five, uh, about twenty five kilometers away from from um, our home, and um, and I think for for me the best part of um, uh, the initial experience for me was to decide whether I was doing this work every day all day for eight hours a day helping other people with their anxieties and um, and my challenge was you know uh, when it came to Jamie Lee's experience was uh, do I actually put on my counselor hat or do I actually put on my mother hat and um, and so today I'm really sharing from the perspective of a mother, because in 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 God's infinite wisdom, He gave me uh, the answer to that situation or that predicament that I was in. That He wanted me to be the mother, and that He called me to be the mother first to Jamie, and that my counseling role was really just a role that He had equipped me in order to serve and help the world out there and the people he brought so i took on uh completely a, a, a mother role and I, i'll just share a quick story with you that that impacted that decision that i had to make because i couldn't be two people to jamie i couldn't be mother and i couldn't be counselor it was just impossible i think i would have increased her anxiety tremendously if i went between the two roles so um in my counseling experience, I once helped a lady who taught me the most powerful lesson that no textbook or university would ever teach me. And she came to me for the, the, the loss of the death of her mother. And she came in incredibly broken and wanted some grief and loss work. And, um, and she shared a story with me, which I'll share very quickly because that helped me make this decision. Uh, when I remembered her experience, she was a highly skilled nurse and um, her mother was dying and she had taken all her annual leave to go and look after her mother in the last few weeks of her life. And um, uh, she took on the role of a nurse for her mother. So she nursed her mother uh, to death and uh, she did all the things a nurse would do if, as if her mother was in hospital because her mother wanted to die at home and she was so angry because she watched her siblings come and visit her mother and the siblings will sit at the mother's bedside hold the mother's hand listen to the mother you know put their head on the mother's pillow talk to the mother and she'd be so angry because she'd say you know i'm doing all the hard work and they're not even helping me and she became so bitter and angry and um long story short 
uh, on her mother's last day or, or on this earth uh, and how, as her life was ebbing away her mother you know uh, she they all could see her mother's life was going and her mother took her hand and and she was standing next to her mother's bed and she took her hand and she said um i just needed you to be the daughter not the nurse and that just it hit me because so often we want to fix everybody's problems and we think we have the answers but we don't you know sometimes somebody just needs a friend or a or a or colleague or a wife or a husband or a brother or sister but i needed to be the mother to jamie and so i took on the mother role the mother role came with incredible pain and incredible my own suffering because i watched her husband who was an incredibly dedicated and committed and he knows this i've told him this over and over again i watched him struggle i watched him carry the strain and it still impacts me now because i have those those pictures in my head of how he was the most dedicated father the most dedicated husband and he was trying to do everything on his own you know care for the baby he, you know, from changing diapers. I think the only thing he didn't do, which Jamie did, was breastfeed. You know, um, I mean, we even debated. I remember, do we put the baby on the bottle so he could take the baby away and do things? And it was a big no from Jamie. So I, so the strain of watching him, and it was also the the, the strain of looking at, you know, the little baby and the, the you know this little baby that came into the world and uh, while jamie is an incredible was an incredible mom during all that time but you worry i think it was more the worry so so i share with you tonight from the perspective of being a mom and you go through a roller coaster of emotions and i think that the emotions of you know sadness uh because you look and you think, well, I can't fix this. You know, I can't actually make it go away. You know, um, I can't get rid of it, you know. And then, you know, there was the sense for me was also the sense of guilt. You know, I actually worked full time and, um, and I served in the church, which was like having a second job as well. So, uh, you know, uh, an a fairly large load uh, in, in the church. And, and I, I felt guilty in that, you know, I wasn't easily and available and accessible. But I then used up all my annual leave and all my roster days off. And it was, everything was just, you know, uh, available to Jamie and the family so that I could um, help. But I think you still go through that sense of guilt if I'm there more. And sometimes I think if I was there more, I'd cause more damage. So in some ways, it's good to have a bit of space. But then when I was away, I would think, I wonder how they're coping today. You know, you know, it may be that Jamie doesn't need me. Maybe Damien does. Maybe that the little, the little, um, you know, that Sahara needed me. So I think you go through this whole roller coaster of emotions, you know, and also you worry about as a parent, you do worry about the uncertainty of how this illness is going to take its course, you know. Um, so we'd watch, we'd watch Jamie, you know, at our family. We have family traditions. We meet regularly, we worship together. So Sabbaths are our days together. You know, we come back home and we have a big family gathering at home and, you know, we eat together and we lounge together. And that's where a lot of our communication takes place. And we're very, we, I would like to believe to some extent, that we we are a family that can communicate at a few different levels helpful not helpful i don't know but but um but we were able to do that and um so i think that for me one of the the the, the impacts was i needed to make sense of this as a mother and i think also it's not un, unusual to wonder what have I done wrong? You know, where did I go wrong? Or what is it that I might have done that might have impacted this? Um, I remember, you know, searching through my own mind and, and doing my own family tracking and looking at was this in my own family, you know, um, uh, trying to trace back for myself in my family background. Was it there? Wasn't it there? Um, you know, I think you just, you want to make meaning 
you want to have a, almost have a sense to justify why all this is happening but really it's just an endless cycle you know um so so i think that as family when you're observing um it's um it can be uh, quite challenging to watch um but i i think that the the important thing that happened for 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 us and this has probably been a blessing for us is that jamie Lee all along was open to receiving help while she was processing her own personal things at her own personal level i think that her openness to wanting help and to reaching out and to reaching out even to us as parents was probably made it so much easier to help and to support. Um, that doesn't happen for every family member, um, you know, that, um, that, that the person is willing to get help for the, for, the, for the illness. So I think that was a big plus for us that we were able to be available um, for uh for jamie and the family so so for, i guess for me what was the things that worked for me um i have to say my first line of attack in any situation my first line of defense my first line of solution has always been to fall at the feet of jesus uh, i have always been a prayer warrior so I uh you know sorry can you hear me i immerse myself yeah i you know i immerse myself uh, uh, in the presence of god and jamie conclude jamie's concluding scripture is really my anchor scripture that all things work together for good for those who love god and are called according to his purpose so Romans 8, 28 is my, my special verse um, that's very close to my own heart. So, so I found that for me, just turning to, to God in prayer and, um, and, uh, and I, I guess studying his word, I've learned something beautiful in, in his word that uh, I spend a lot of time in the book of Psalms praying all those beautiful prayers, you know, just flip through the book of Psalms. There's amazing prayers there. And just praying those prayers um, and asking God for deliverance, for confidence, for not for Jamie. I This was my growth experience. I think he was moving me in my development as mother. He was moving me into a space of helping me to see Jamie Lee as the adult daughter, uh, not the little girl that was my girl, um, the, that she was now the adult woman, uh, the, 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 a mother. And so he was taking me into a whole new space that I had to go. And only God can take you there. So, so there was some power in, 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 the, in studying the word and in praying because it not only brought me uh, enormous strength uh, and they say in your weakness god's strength is manifest so you know i learned uh, uh, i learned that from personal experience but the one thing that it also taught me is that um, the prayer would would often be interceding intercessory prayer you know i'd be praying for jamie and there's power in intercessory prayer you know sometimes we say to people oh i'll pray for you and and maybe we do and maybe we don't you know but God told, taught me the value of true intercessory prayer. So, um, so I think for me, he gave me strength for me, but he gave me the ability to pray for Jamie. And, and the other thing that I remember, it was really funny. I battled with God and I really went to war with him, I think. Um, I remember one day saying to him in absolute desperation, can you just please keep your mansions? I don't want the mansions. I don't want the streets of gold. I don't want the pearly gates. I don't want all those things. I just want you to save my daughter. And uh, I think that that put things into perspective for me, that uh, he was doing a work behind the scene that I couldn't even see. So, so I think that for me, the, the, 
and just listening to Jamie tonight, I can see how God has answered that prayer in, in a mighty way and has begun that journey of, um, I guess, uh, preparing her to meet him when he comes. The other thing that I did, which was really helpful, I've always had a professional coach and uh, to help me be a good counsellor, to be uh, a compassionate counsellor. And, and my coach, of course, is a counsellor himself. Um, so during that period of time, what was really helpful was that he, I switched um, roles and he would provide me with some counseling as well. So I was, you know, um, I believe that we must be humble enough to reach out for help ourselves. But, but even the work he did with me was not about Jamie Lee. It was about me learning to let go as a mum learning to know my rightful place, uh, learning to re-establish my boundaries um, in my in Jamie Lee's life, learning to know how to help and what help is, uh, you know, helpful and not helpful. So there was a lot of things that I, and my own personal grief that I had to go through as well. Um, one of the greatest strengths I used to have is to go over to help Jamie, you know, just sometimes practical help and um, I used to take little Sahara out to, you know, walk, um, you know, just on the street to have a little bit of time out with her. And I used to find those moments with her, just showing her the, the little dogs in the area, the horses in the fields and, and, you know, birds on trees. And just those moments for me was quite restorative. And, uh, and I felt a sense of bonding with her that was also extremely helpful that even though, you know, Jamie was going through this experience, it kind of gave me some um, extra moments to, to bond when I went to, to help and to support. Um, the thing that I would encourage people to, and I had the advantage of this, is that I'd already had an enormous amount of knowledge and understanding of the condition. So I, I always say, you know, if you are living with someone with an illness, then you must learn the illness yourself. You must learn the facts of the illness. You must learn what is uh, the illness all about and how to help. So I was fortunate that I had some of that knowledge that I could access when I needed it, but I didn't need it all because I was mom. So, uh, you know, the bits that I needed, I used. And, and maybe sometimes the bits I didn't need, I used. And if I saw Jamie get irritated, then I knew I was treading the wrong, the wrong path. So I'd back off very quickly. But I think what's also important is to learn to know um, what enables the illness and what frees the illness. So, you know, the do's and the don'ts, it's so important, you know, there's often a list of do's and don'ts, you know, I think the do's are that, you know, never give up hope, you know, that this illness can be, um, can be helped and that, you know, ensure that your expectations are not high, you know, that you are willing to recognize small steps, um, uh, in the recovery process and congratulate those small steps and and in listening to Jamie Lee and why she didn't like the first counsellor. I remember sitting down with her and saying to her, you're just learning that not all counsellors are good. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and we had an amazing conversation about what wasn't good about that counsellor. But what Jamie didn't realise that in that conversation I had, I think, I had discovered what would work for her. So when I eventually linked her with somebody, I searched for somebody that I could match what I think she wanted and and bingo, she had the connection with that person. So it was, um, it, and I think that helps when you sit down and you talk about things and we were fortunate that we did talk about it. I think the other important thing is is deciding when you're in a situation like this, do you want to be, I'll use, a, I'll use an analogy, you either become a sponge or you become a sieve. Um, and last night somebody asked the question, what do you do when you're with somebody and you're so drained out that you need a whole week to recover after mm -hmm. you've been with somebody that's so unwell? And I think that's being the sponge because you're taking it all in and you get so saturated yourself. I chose to be the sieve and the sieve lets some things just 
flow out and it just catches the important things and and the important things were you know the things that jamie and her family needed sometimes they needed some meals cooked or sometimes they needed some practical support sometimes they needed time with you know have the, the little um uh, sahara being cared for so they were just all those little things that you know um uh, that we could do we did but i think sometimes you you, you walk a tight rope of um you know getting some things right and getting some things wrong and having understanding and then sometimes just no understanding and while jamie wouldn't always share very openly uh, her non-verbals will tell me that get out of the way mom this is not the right thing to say to me um you know because sometimes the desperation comes back in and you want to want to do more to make it right so so they just were some of the things that really, really helped me. And, and knowing when to refer her to the right person was also very, um, uh, very helpful. So there are things that I think we shouldn't do. I think we must be careful with judging. Um, but I think sometimes that can happen quite unintentionally as well. You know, sometimes we think people can just snap out of it, you know. Um, um, uh, uh, why don't you just snap out of it and just take a deep breath and let's just do it, you know? But sometimes I think we think that and we think it's that easy because it's easy for us. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I think they are the things that we need to avoid, you know, doing, um, setting the bar too high. And uh, I think, uh, you know, um, going over the same ground when it's not necessary as well uh, is important. So... Um, so I've been fortunate that I've been able to help Jamie Lee in a very almost um, caring, kind and compassionate way. But sometimes I think I got it wrong as well. This is not about perfection. This is about us all learning on the journey. I needed to learn some amazing things as a mother. I needed to change myself. So, um, And I found that probably the greatest lesson that God taught me was the lesson of learning to let go so and let god you know that statement we always say let go let god and i think it's it's easier said than done but i think that um that um yeah when we when we learn the art of let going and not guilting a person you know guilt doesn't motivate it's not a motivator so um so i think that that's something that i learned too that god was reshaping me as a mother, he was reshaping me as a mother of an adult daughter. He was reshaping me to learn how to respect um, and, uh, and uh, my daughter, who is now a mother. We were transitioning many, many roles. And, and I think that um, it's special that God has such an interest in our lives and that he wants to teach us all many, many lessons. So so there were many lessons for me to learn. and. And, and, you know, some of the lessons that I take away from all of this experience is, you know, that, um, that it is important to have clearer boundaries um, with an adult child. And I learned that uh, to turn to God um, when I'm not okay, um, that God actually um, can continue to do his work in my own life. And, um, and I think the other thing sometimes when we're in the situation that can be t really tough is is learning to fill our own tanks so that we can offer and for me the filling of my own tank was you know i this was my private devotions with god it fills me instantly and and i keep doing that every day you know but i was kept up my own exercise program and you know i we generally eat healthy as a family so we kept doing that and um and I think that that helped me keep my fuel in my tank reasonably um, up some days, half a tank, some days maybe full tank, three-quarter tank, didn't really matter, but there was fuel there to keep supporting and to keep helping and to keep asking what was needed as well. And sometimes I'd forget to ask and just do it and then go, oh, I should have checked. But, but I think... Um, one of the other big uh, do's is is to be very forgiving in the process, and and uh, you know um, I think both way it worked both way for Jamie and and um, even myself as a mother because in sometimes in the stress and the desperation you know you can have uh, unintentional conflicts that emerge when when you share and talk with each other, but the sense of forgiveness 
of each other and forget it. We have a big value statement on our wall when you enter our home, which is a value statement of our family. And one of the things we say is, you know, we do loud and we do forgiveness, um, and but we do love. So I think when it's all motivated from a platform of love and um, that it is such a blessing. And, and in conclusion, I want to say that God had a plan for all of us. But the greatest joy he has given me in, in, in this entire journey and experience is there is no greater joy than to serve God alongside your daughter. And, uh, and we serve God together. And it's not just Jamie, it's her husband too. We, 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 um, yeah, we serve God together. And I think that that is every parent's desire and wish. And I feel blessed that I have that. So, um, so I want to say that um, it was God who helped me in my journey as a mother. And uh, and I hope under no circumstances, Jamie, I sounded like a counselor. So I know you tell me. But uh, yeah, so that's my story as a mother. That with God, He's still I'm still a work in progress, and He is still helping me through um, learning more lessons along the way. So thank you. Very good. Thank you so much, Lynette. Um, it's so good for parents to listen to you as well, because it's hard enough to be a parent and not to try to fix things, but to be a counsellor and not to, to try not to be the counsellor, it must be really difficult. Um, it's And it's really important lesson to learn even for myself, you know, when I see that my family members are uh, maybe not eating well or something. I think by presenting all the right information, all the evidence, that's going to change something. But sometimes, like you said, they just want me to maybe um, be the daughter, be the relative that just um, sympathizes with them and loves them, not tries to fix things. Yeah, and I think we need to continue to be who we are rather than who our role, what our role is. Mm-hmm. You know, that God is, is shaping all of us. So I think that that is so important. You want a relationship with somebody not based on your role, but based on the love that brings you together. Mm -hmm. Very true. Um, so we had some encouraging comments, um, some questions as well. I would like to encourage people to ask questions to Lynette and Jamie Lee. And as time allows, we'll try to address them. Um, so someone says, beautiful Christian interaction. I just couldn't imagine the emotional pain watching your daughter go through that. I feel he's teaching us total dependence upon him. Um, thank you, Lynette. Um, and also another comment, definitely great advice. Reliving with an ill person, Lynette, it uh, especially validates the sufferer with not only mental illness but all chronic illnesses. Okay, so very good. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any questions, please type, to the, uh, type them. Um, I would like to ask a question about anxiety in general. Obviously, we know that it's not untreatable. It can be treated and we are very grateful that we have the source to go through for comfort and for wisdom and peace. Um, what about, so this is obviously general anxiety that someone might always be prone to, but what about um, the social anxiety? Is that just an extension of general anxiety? Is it just isolated? How can that be treated? So I think um, I'm happy to answer that. I think that when we you know, they have various forms of anxieties. You know, some people have, uh, Jamie's was generalized and she shared, uh, she gave us a really uh, good snapshot of what generalized anxiety looks like. Um, social anxiety is, you know, the, the, the fear of getting out and being in crowds and being with people. Um, it's a very specific type of anxiety. So some people who work alone in an office are happy to go to work and be very high functioning, but, you know, invite them to the office party and they freak out, you know. So, so um, you know, yes, yeah, so social anxiety is one. Some people have what we call phobias, you know, like fears of heights or you know, um, 
fears of uh, we have a friend who has uh, fears of spiders you know um um some have fears of snakes in particular like so i think you can get a whole range of different types of anxieties i mean another big one that um, impacts people is performance anxiety as well you know when you have to perform in front of a crowd and, and you know i know some people who take heaps of medication before they do that you know to to block that anxiety in the brain but but you know it's really just performance anxiety so i think when you look at social anxiety it's it's in in that context it's often people who are struggling with um with social aspects you know socializing with people at, at particular functions or uh, group gatherings and they seem to do better when it's one-on-one -on -one rather than with groups as well i think that that's something that's a really good question that you've raised because coming out of the pandemic or coming through this lockdown period we're seeing a lot of that at the moment but we know why so it's mm -hmm. not quite social anxiety. I think it's the it's the impact of the lockdowns and it's the impact of the social distancing. Um, whether we can say it's social anxiety now, I think it's still a bit too early to say. We have to wait to see mm -hmm. what the long-term impacts are on people. But I think some people are just super conscious, uh, cautious now, you know. So it looks mm -hmm. like they got used to the idea of being by themselves and being away from people that, they're a little bit reluctant to to go and, and, and be with people. Like I've heard people say some people don't want to come back to church, you know. Um, I don't know if that quite is social anxiety. Um, it might just be a short-term impact from uh, from what, people, what we've all been through. Uh, but I think that if it lasts very long, then it can be quite easily become social anxiety. Mm -hmm. I guess it could be social awkwardness as well. Like you mentioned, uh, you know, we're more cautious. Um, it's more difficult to go back to church. I know I was looking forward to going back to church. And then when I did, you find that even though restrictions ease slowly, then there's less people coming to church. It's like they got comfortable. Um, so, yeah, maybe it's just the awkwardness. Mm. And and it's what it's the impact of the social distancing and the lockdowns that we've all experienced. You know, uh, I think that in 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 the, in that experience, you know, uh, what happened to us is not what we wanted to happen. So that impact is going to be with us for a little while. Mm -hmm. That's true. Well, I hope it's not um, it's not for good because all of a sudden we are aware of people sneezing and that they can give us something. <laughs> not that we didn't know about those things before, um, but now we are more aware of these things and maybe some of it has been hyped up. I'm not sure. Um, but certainly I think last night when I shared, uh, you know, the impact of the pandemic, uh, I think uh, we, uh, we still to see that come through. You know, we're only starting to see that. Uh, I, I spoke to a, a, a gentleman this morning who was telling me that um, he, he was washing the windows of his uh, office building. And I said, why are you doing this? Where's the people who normally do this? And he said, oh, they're volunteers and they don't want to come back, you know. Uh, so he's lost a lot of, you know, volunteers and staff. And so... We're in for big changes, and uh, and I think um, that's already rolling out before our eyes anyway. So, um, um, yeah, uh, so social anxiety, I don't know if that answered your question, Sosie. Yeah, I guess it's more um, isolated, and um, you're hoping that maybe some of it is the impact of the pandemic, that we're seeing more of that. Maybe people are more comfortable being behind the keyboard, behind the screen. That's, um, you know, seems to be the norm now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and also, Jamie Lee, you mentioned about the masking of the symptoms. And it's very, um, it's very prevalent. Like, we don't always uh, see the person suffering when they actually could be suffering. And I know for myself as well that sometimes people may say they can't see uh, my anxiety or they can't see the struggles that I have when I'm socializing with people but the masking also um, 
uh, could you maybe explain how draining that can be like when you're socializing but you really would rather be uh at home or not socializing what impact does it have on you like physically um yeah so it can be quite tiring obviously um you know i think for me i i was such a social bubbly happy person before and i loved people so i absolutely loved people so i think talking um from the social anxiety aspect of it when you have general anxiety that can be an aspect that actually pops up as well so you know like you don't want to have a panic attack in public so you're fearful that that might happen or you know um can people see that you're not feeling well or not looking like how you're normally looking you know so it's just all those thoughts that you were thinking and then but you know not sort of at the time wanting people to know that maybe I was struggling with that um so I did you know um only reveal it to the people I felt comfortable with I guess um because there was times that I did attend church and I was still going to church and um facing people um so yeah so I think it could it was very um tiring um and I think I would come home and it would probably make the symptoms worse because I had that you know, that time of trying to be all, yep, everything's okay sort of a thing. And that's why I think it's so important not to do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I guess perhaps to take a break as well when we don't feel like um, socialising or we don't feel like, because it can be, like I said, it can be quite draining if you are still recovering. Um, but in your case, you are a social uh, kind of person. So yeah. well, I think like, I think it's also important that you don't isolate yourself because I feel like as if, if I isolated myself completely, it probably wouldn't have helped the situation either. So mm -hmm. I think that's where, you know, I've talked about really persevering through it. And even though I may not have felt I wanted to be. Sometimes I did enjoy those, you know, those moments of being around people as draining as it was. Um, it, it, mm -hmm. it can take your mind off um, the anxiousness or the, the feelings you're feeling. So, yeah, I, I definitely would recommend, um, you know, even if you don't feel like it, just, just do it because being around people really can lift your spirits and um, mm -hmm. um, isolation is not great for mental illness mm -hmm. that's true I have a friend as well that she talks about how she is not exactly a social type of person a sociable type of person but she says that her anxiety is made worse when she decides not to socialize so the more she kind of listens to that anxiety um, side of things um, mm -hmm. the worse it becomes for her so yeah definitely definitely yeah um, I believe that. And I guess I could ask um, both you, Lynette, and um, Madame Lee a question about, uh, can we say perhaps um, it's not a sin, but as a Christian, could we be antisocial Christian? Because we know, obviously, Satan is trying to attack us um, with our mental health, we, and we know that mental health um, uh, affects the whole, you know, physical being. As a Christian, could we... Um, embraced our um, you know we've been given a diagnosis we've got social anxiety or just in general anxiety as a Christian could we be anti-social Christian or um, we should actually be um, fighting against um, those anxieties and um, make sure we are in in public we are sociable and um, helping like Jesus was helping I'm happy to have a go with that question, if I'm understanding it correctly. When you say antisocial, are you meaning that, like, cut yourself off? Is that what you're saying from people? Well, can we say, well, we are and uh, we're antisocial. We're not sociable Christians. Can we actually um, embrace either um, our diagnosis or embrace the fact that, well, this is the type of person I am or... Um, as Christians, should we be more sociable, mingling with the public and um, going to church often, serving? So I think, you know, um, I, I always um, 
there's three steps and I, I i'll go back to the bible so if you're asking me a story for christians right so um you know there's three steps in our journey with christ you know we're justified in him is when we make the decision to serve him and to follow him um and then the process of sanctification and uh is 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 a is a lifetime process for us that jesus is when the spirit dwells in us he is doing his work to shape us and develop us to be disciples and i don't know that we can be a good disciple if we choose to be antisocial. let's put it that way that you know we then uh, uh we won't have opportunities to serve as we're doing tonight you know so i really believe that through the process of jesus making us to be more, the spirit working in our lives to be more like jesus that um that that is also in itself a painful process which we just described this evening but i think that it is god's will for us to to share our stories um it is god's will to share our experiences and this is how we build community this is how we encourage each other i also think that it is important for us to not treat mental illness any different to how you would treat somebody with cancer or diabetes okay uh, and this is the big problem we have is we kind of isolate certain illnesses and so um you know we wouldn't say to somebody who has cancer you know we wouldn't have those expectations we'll all be praying for them and we'll be checking on them and we'll be asking how they're doing and offering enormous amounts of support and i think that that's the same approach we need to have when we are dealing with someone with a mental illness rather than to shy away from it so mm -hmm. um so i do believe that it is not god's plan for us to become anti-social i i i i hear people saying you know but that's just who i am and you know well i can't be bubbly and chirpy and i can't be an extrovert because i'm an introvert and and i can't mm -hmm. be a public speaker because you know i i'm not a, a public speaker i'm a more quiet a loner person and I just say, then you're not listening to what Jesus can do in your life because he can take an introvert. He may not make you an extrovert, but he'll use an introvert for his purposes. So, you know, um, so I think that we have this amazing God who can transform us, redefine us, reshape us and mold us after his ways. So I do believe that um, he wants us to be effective disciples for him. Mm hmm very good. I guess that answers more of my questions about the personalities because we know that we have different personalities and whether that can change or not. I heard another counsellor say that our personality will not change. Um, yeah, but I guess we have to just fight harder <laughs> than maybe more um, a sociable person would. Well, I don't know that we even need to do the fighting. I think that uh, God mm -hmm. will work in us and through us as he blesses us with whatever you know every one of us is different and and uh, and god he's he's a god of diversity you know he he's he, he wants us to be different and um and if we don't believe in change then we have to really look at our faith right because we serve a god who brings change um who who is the the game changer he is the life changer he's the transformer of 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 us and our being so you know the spirit can do enormous work in our lives if we are willing That's i true. think in, in mental illness i think for far too long i might have touched on that last night is for far too long we we kind of almost think that mental illness is is somebody that's lacking faith or you know you may battle mental illness somebody may battle you know a terminal illness you know and somebody may battle you know um, unstable blood sugars in their body you know um, they're all illnesses some people addictions you know so uh, there's hope for everybody mm -hmm. And my um, my husband and I know that my husband said that, but I also know even people that don't say that to me directly, there is this understanding that as a Christian, we should know better. We have the hope, we have these Bible verses to, you know, lean on. And as a Christian, we should know better and we should not be suffering with mental illness. But um, do you think Satan is perhaps attacking us more? Um, than someone that's not really looking to God. 
I think, I, think, he, I think he's on he's on the attack anyway. Yeah. You know, I think he he will use whatever he, he can. If we look around us in the world that we're living in right now, we see he is he's really going like a roaring lion seeking the ones he can devour, whether it is through mental illness or through all range of issues, you know. Um, it's not just mental mm -hmm. illness. I think that um like any illnesses, illnesses need help, they need the right support. And I believe that uh, while the world offers us support, some of it is helpful, some of it is not so helpful. Uh, we have to work that out for ourselves. And, and I think that if we, if our default is back to God's plan and we make that the starting point, then that mm -hmm. becomes the foundation for which you can build and take from the world what the world gives if it matches God's plan. Mm -hmm. that makes sense so um i think we yes i i i think that as a church we need to become a little bit more mental health uh, increase our literacy around mental health i i do think that because we've got people sitting with us in the pews that are struggling and, and we don't even know mm -hmm. that's very true um but did you want to add anything to that jamie lee yeah, no, I, I, you know, um, I think that um, Satan definitely, um, he's not going to attack those that aren't close with God, you know. Um, it's definitely, he does it because he doesn't want you to get close to God. Um, so you'll feel that when you are the closest to God, that's when you probably feel the most spiritual attacks. Mm -hmm. That's and, yeah. so true. Mm. Yeah, and 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 I think Jamie's thought, comment just triggered a thought in me, and and that is that he's going to use your vulnerability to mm. attack. So if yeah. he knows mm -hmm. you've got anxiety disorder, he's going to go there because he goes, "That's the one I can play with," right? If he knows that you know you have a, a troubled marriage, then he's going to go there. You know, if he knows you've got a, a child that you're praying for to come back into the faith, well, he's going to go and play with that area you know so mm -hmm. i think that he, he works his strategies but i think more than that we serve a god who's victorious but if we're willing to just claim that victory mm -hmm. that's very true and also maybe one last comment before we address the last um couple of questions or comments um so i have heard this a few times before that uh people that eat healthy people that well we've seen these people they eat really healthy they eat organic they eat vegan but their character is really not good i've seen people link the two together um i mean what are your thoughts on that obviously you don't have to be a nutritionist to comment on that so what do you guys think about that oh i don't know if that's my expertise but um i just think that um you know, we, we sometimes use criteria to to define what is good and not good. You know, like we've, we've got unhealthy vegetarians, right? You can be on a plant-based diet and be on an incredibly unhealthy plant-based diet, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I don't know that that is the criteria for being a good person, if that makes sense. You know, whether if you're a vegan, that means you're good or, or a better Christian. I think they're really mm -hmm. not the 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 way we ought to be measuring people really um i think that um you know when we build relationships with people you know um how do we measure goodness and you know christ saw the goodness in everybody he saw the potential in everybody um not not what they were but what they could become so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question directly, um, Sosie, but I think sometimes we use these superficial criteria to to determine who's good and not good. I think mm -hmm. it's superficial criteria. It doesn't mean if I'm vegan, I'm a good Christian. Yeah, I guess I've heard from just close um, people as well that um these people are vegan so then their characters are not good so it's like if you eat 
if you eat healthier, you are more, you know, you're more focused on that area, then somehow um, it's more difficult to deal with those people. So maybe we feel judged as well because we talked about diet as well, how it plays a huge role. And I've seen also, um, I have seen on myself, I've seen people as well um, testify to that too, that when they eat healthier, their mental health improves. So perhaps it is also a way to either justify um, their eating habits or just, um, yeah, maybe we feel judged by others healthy eating. So I've seen that in church as well being mentioned. So uh, that's why I guess I mentioned that. Um, okay, so um, another person says, Honesty is critical, letting them know that all disease has a cause. Diet plays a huge role in mental health. Mm -hmm. um, that is true. You mentioned mm -hmm. that. We often don't address the diet. If gas at station is bad, we can see it immediately. But with mental health, it must because people are most part functioning outwardly. Um, Okay, so then with the comment about, yes, Satan attacks God's children um, that are on the way to vindicate God's glory, my chronic illness has brought me closer to God. Go Amen. figure. Amen. And we know that to be true. I've had experience with Satan playing upon my vulnerability. That's um, for um, Lynette's comment. I've seen vegans that both drink and smoke. It was incredibly weird. <laughs> That's also vegan. <laughs> it's part of the unhealthy vegan diet. Okay, so it was a blessing and a pleasure to have you both with us, Lynette and Jamie Lee. If you have um, final comments, um, you're welcome to, um, I guess, um, give us some final thoughts. Jamie, you... Um, no, just thank you for the opportunity and, you know, obviously if you're um, going through anxiety, um, you're definitely not alone. Um, you don't need to isolate yourself. Definitely reach out for help because there is so much there um, and definitely if you have faith in God, um, go to the source of peace and, and healing. Mm -hmm. Amen. And to all those family members out there that are living with someone that they love dearly, that is struggling with a um, mental health uh, illness, I say um, two things, you know, make sure that you look after yourself so that you can look after others um, and look after your loved one. But you have to look after yourself first um, so that you are well, that you are the sieve, not the sponge, and that uh, you can offer the best possible support that you know what you are able to at the time based on what you know. And, and the second thing I would say is, you know, um, is find somebody impartial to talk with, um, not just friends and not just people who love you um, because they're going to just tell you what you want to hear, you know, um, find somebody that uh, is a safe somebody to go to that is a um, person that is going to help you grow through the experience um, because that's the greatest gift you can give yourself and give your loved one mm -hmm. absolutely and um if nothing else, the, the whole thing was very informative, just very good advice um, from both of you, Lynette and Jamie Lee. Um, but if I can take one thing from this talk is, is your advice about not be the sponge but be the sieve because I, um, I definitely sometimes feel like I retain a lot of extra information that is not needed <laughs> for brain health. So it's, yeah, really good. But the whole conversation, like someone mentioned as well, just very good um, balanced Christian talk. And even if you're not a Christian, um, studies have shown that if you have faith, it helps a lot with mental and physical health. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to thank you so much from everyone, um, from everyone else. Um, we were 
greatly blessed by this conversation and we're looking forward to hopefully having you back another time in the future. Thank you. Um, we close with prayer. Yes, I was going to ask if one of you wants to offer a prayer. That would be great. Thank you. All right, let's pray. I'm happy to pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that um, uh, we've had this opportunity to share. There's someone out there that may be struggling, someone that um, may uh, be needing a, um, to discover how you can help them. I pray tonight that uh, through these messages of uh, the stories we've shared and the, the real experiences we've had, that you will use it to bring comfort and peace to someone else and bring hope. Thank you that you are our hope and thank you that you are the one who can restore and the one who can deliver and the one who saves us. And I thank you for all those that have watched and that will watch. And I pray that it will be a blessing to them. We pray for Sossi's ministry in a special way too. And we thank you for all that she shares and does and, and, uh, and gives us amazing and enormous opportunities. And I pray that you will bless her and her dear husband, Dian, and the family, and that this ministry will grow from strength to strength. Most of all, Lord, we long for this day. We know it's going to be soon when we look at the eastern skies and you'll burst through it to take us home when we'll have no more suffering, no more pain, no more tears to shed. And, Father, that we will spend eternity with you. We're waiting for that day. Come soon, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much. You. Looking forward to seeing you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us again for another presentation. I hope and I believe that you all were blessed. Um, Please don't forget, um, like, subscribe and share with those who will be blessed as well and who will benefit from these presentations. Um, remember, you can email us with your health questions before our presentations and after as well. If you have any questions to be addressed to our speakers for future presentations, please do so. Our email address has been mentioned before, take charge of your health, 101 at gmail.com. Um, for our next and final weekend, we will host a health psychologist. Again, same day, same time, Friday and Saturday, 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time or Brisbane Australia Time. And you have the information um, about Lynette and um, what she does if you need to reach out for health. Also, you can email her and email us as well. You can find the details, as we mentioned before, in the description of this video. Um, we are very much looking forward to seeing you all next time, next Friday, again, at 8 p.m. Australian Standard Time. Thank you so much. God bless. And uh, we will see you next time. Bye now.